Deep Summit is a partnership between three organizations, the Arcus Foundation, GRASP, the Great Ape Survival Partnership with the UN, and the Wildlife Film Festival. And um, it's a, a first time collaboration. We're thrilled to be here. And Annette Lanyao, who is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Great Apes for the Arcus Foundation. And I would like to also introduce um, an old friend of mine. In this room, I feel very confident in saying that there are probably two Wyoming natives, and they're both sitting up here. My friend John Turner has a long, long lifetime history of um, protecting and advocating for creatures and habitat. He was the head of the Fish and Wildlife Service for the United States, and probably his most noteworthy credential as a steward of the land is that he's a third generation uh, rancher of the Triangle X Ranch in Grand Teton National Park. You pass by it every day you're here. Look off to the east uh, when you're passing the mountains, and that's what John has been taking care of all of his life. John Turner. Well, good morning, and let me uh, join Lisa and Doug and Annette in welcome you all here. Welcome to Jackson Hole. It's really a magical time of year for us here, and hopefully you all are going to get out and enjoy the landscape. Uh, I want to begin by saluting all of you, not only for your presence here, but having visited with many of you. I know that uh, so many of you give of your dedication and time and sweat and tears to protect the life forms with which we share this planet. And it's just an honor to have you here in Jackson Hole. This is exciting for us to welcome you here. Uh, Lisa and her little band of cohorts work year round to bring us the Wildlife Film Festival, always fun for uh, Jackson Hole and the environment. Um, I had the distinct honor of being in public life politics for 35 years. Uh, I really went into politics because of my interest in wildlife conservation. I was a young wildlife biologist, did some of the first eagle and osprey work in the greater Yellowstone system. Somehow uh, was a dropout of a PhD program at the University of Michigan because of my interest in wildlife conservation. Um, so I served 20 years in the Wyoming legislature and then had the distinct honor of being director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service then heading up a nonprofit to protect wildlife habitat around America. And then, as Lisa said, had my opportunity at the State Department under George W. Bush and Colin Powell. Uh, the thing I'd like to talk about briefly was, as Assistant Secretary, I had the opportunity to head up the sustainability efforts on behalf of the United States in preparation for the World Summit in Johannesburg. And we did a, the United States uh, did a lot of multiple programs, access to fresh water, access to energy, uh, addressing the wildlife trade, uh, infectious diseases. Uh, I might just point out that uh, I think we were focused a lot in Africa because uh, the president had such an affinity for Africa. Uh, he wouldn't like my saying this, but I, on a couple occasions, saw him break into tears just over his agony about challenges and conditions in Africa. In fact, he put more money into the emerging world and Africa than any president in, in recent United States history. The effort I'd like to talk about is the Congo Basin Forest Partnership, uh, which was really a, a, a representative, a headline event for us in our focus on tropical forestry. And Jan McAlpin's here. I followed Jan's orders. Uh, she headed up our forestry program at the State Department and now is a leader at the United Nations in the forestry forum. But our focus on uh, tropical forestry was from the Amazon to the Congo Basin. The Congo Basin um, was pretty special to me. I had the opportunity to meet Michael Fay. Uh, Michael and I spent a lot of time together. That wonderful biologists and flip-flops. We went over and traversed the entire length of his megatrack. And the result was we created uh, 27 new national parks protecting about 25 million acres. But I think uh, the thing I'd like to talk about was 
yes, the focus was on the signature, the critters in the mornings we got up and went into meadows and saw gorillas and forest ele elephants and surfing hippos out on the coast. And it became apparent to me that if you're going to address wildlife conservation, as many of you know, it has to be more than just focused on a critter or focused on a specific habitat. In my opinion, it has to be an integrated approach to sustainability. And I think there are several tools, several legs to the stool of sustainability. One, I hope you'd agree, yes, environmental sustainability, but you also have to look at social sustainability, education and health care. People have to have access to good education. You have to deal with malaria. You have to deal with uh, parasites and HIV AIDS. A third leg of the stool, I think, is economic stability. The people in the Congo Basin, the leadership, what were they interested in was jobs and, and economic return. So you have to deal with all three of those. And then there's some overlaying issues that I also think you have to deal with. Maybe it's the seat of the stool. You have to have good science. You have to think about security. I remember meeting with the president of Ghana, and he pulled me aside from his aides, and he said, Ms. Turner, there's something the Americans need to realize in the West is that we're very poor, we're a pretty loving, basically Christian society, and now extreme elements are coming to our villages, and they're preaching hate, and they're preaching violence. So security, uh, I think, is a big part of it. And then I'd hope you'd all agree we've got to deal with rule of law. The corruption in Africa, from Angola, all those countries. Uh, so we sent over judges to help them deal with their laws, their ministries, their courts, trying to get a active and media, get civil groups involved. And one of my underlying beliefs, wherever you go in the world with real issues, especially the emerging world, um, you have to empower women. So often, all over the world, from Kenya to the Congo Basin, if you wanted to get something done, you empower women, especially local women. So the Congo Basin Forest Partnership uh, was 17 countries led by the United States. We had the American uh, Association of Forestry and Paper. Uh, we had French logging companies, tried to engage oil and gas, got some support from them. Um, and wonderful support from faith-based organizations, the, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, World Wildlife Fund. It was really a collaborative effort, and I think that's what it takes. It's, it's partnerships, it's collaborative. We have to combine our resources, combine our passions and our know-how, and that's what we try to do in the Congo Basin. I've been asked to relate one incident that happened to me over there, uh, a little bizarre. Uh, my experience with wildlife here as a rancher and outfitter to encounters with grizzly bears and dealing with wolf reintroduction and so forth. So the, about the only experience I'd had with big primates was when Clint Eastwood brought an orangutan to Jackson Hole to shoot a movie called Any Which Way You Can. Beautiful animal, uh, incredibly powerful animal. So when I started becoming involved in the Congo Basin, I got to deal with Jane Goodall and her and, and the orphanage she had in the Congo. And, but to see the gorillas, uh, the great apes in the Congo Basin was, was really a spiritual event for me. I had to go back to Brazzaville after a year of this partnership to transfer leadership from the United States to France. And President Chirac was coming, and so we were going to pass the baton to France. So I was going to Brazzaville. I had a deputy who was the head of the environment program, she was going, she said, John, I want to go and see gorillas. I said, we don't have time to go look for gorillas. We've got to go to these meetings, and we've got a lot, a lot of people to meet with and environment. And she said, I want to go see gorillas. So she bugged me for several weeks, and I said, all right, we'll go over a day early. We don't have much chance to see gorillas, but we'll go a day early. I called the consulate, said, Mr. Turner, we can't one day go out and see gorillas. I said, well, do the best you can. So we got over to Brazzaville, and sure enough, 5 a.m. in the morning, two Land Rovers picked us up, and away we went. 
for about two hours through the jungles and rough roads and finally arrived at a little village and on a big river. I can't think of the river its name, but it was a big river. It was swollen. It was muddy. There were logs floating down it. And there was about a 20-foot dugout with a big motor on the back of it and a few lawn chairs in it. So we went up the river. We went up for almost two hours. There were no villages. There were no power lines or roads or anything. And they said, well, Miss Turner, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we watched a small band of gorillas on an island up here. Probably won't be there, but that's about our only chance. So we stopped and picked up two guys in a thatched hut. They were uh, bio one biologist looking at the gorillas and another guy with an AK-47 trying to protect the gorillas. So we went up the river for another half hour. And this river is just swollen and we're in the middle of nowhere. About all you see is crocs and hippos. And they, and they said, Miss Turner, they pulled over next to the bank. We're about 20 feet from the bank, and the water's rushing. They said, Miss Turner, tie the bowline off on a tree. So I can do that. So they shut the motor off and started to give these tars and yelps, and we sat there very quietly, you know. We hadn't been there 10 minutes, and a silverback walks out on the bank. So, wow, this is something. He even, we're taking pictures, and he even bent the, brush down around him so we'd get better. And he's looking at us and looking at us and said, wow, this is really something. Well, just like that, this gorilla goes up the trees and now he's right above the dugout. So, wow, you know, now we've got a silver tip right above us. And the guys that knew more about gorillas than we did, he said, Mr. Turner, untie the rope. <laughs> and they fired up the engine, and pretty big. And they, we started to pull away from the bank. They, they knew that was not a good situation to be in. The gorilla swung down out of the trees and landed in the middle of the dugout. <laughs> I'm in the front, with my deputy second, the gorilla, and my two or three handlers in the back. The motor's running full tilt, we're pulling out in the river. The guys that knew something about gorillas dived in the river. <laughs> <laughs> so we head out into the river, and, the, and I looked around, and the only ones now in the, in the dugout are me, my deputy, and this gorilla. <laughs> and as many of you know, uh, the, the large gorillas don't swim, the, the little ones do. But so we're headed out into a river. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's a churning river. We're picking up speed. We're going in a big circle. And I thought, this is not going to end well. Somebody's going to die. We're going into the water. This thing's going to bust up. This, this is a bad situation. I got home later and was telling my wife, Mary Kay, she said, did you get any pictures? <laughs> but I knew we were all going in the water. We were all probably going to die. If we didn't drown in the river, the crocs or the hicks again. Well, we made a big turn. Now we're headed into shore. We're going like, we're going like crazy. Uh, and I could see we were going to head into some bushes and trees, so I got up front of the dugout and I thought, at least I can grab a tree or something. Well, we were very fortunate. The, the dugout just kind of slowly bored into the trees. I grabbed the, grabbed the tree. The, the dugout swung around in the current. The gorilla said, I've had all the fun I, can have, I want. So he <laughs> swung up in the tree, grabbed an orange life preserver, took it on a tree, and he said, all right, I've played your game. Now you guys come ashore and play my game. Um, that was my gorilla story, Lisa. <laughs> it was quite an experience for this old cowboy from Wyoming. Um, and it got all over Africa how this Secretary of the United States and he said, oh, Mr. Turner, we've never seen anything like this and we encountered a gorilla. But, so that's my gorilla story. Uh, let me thank you all again for being here, for your focus and commitment. Uh, hopefully we can all talk about uh, approach to wildlife conservation. I think we need to be focused on people. Obviously we need a lot more resources. We need an integrated approach. We need lots of partners, all hands on deck. With that, thank you very much. Over the next four days, we're going to have a conference that's going to have um, very different audiences. Um, we have a group that are very much focused on media and film and disseminating and making the world aware of the importance of conservation and the importance of all the issues that we face in conservation. We also, obviously, and especially today, have a, um, an audience that's primarily the scientists and the conservationists doing the work on the ground. 
And then over the next four days, we'll also have increasing attendance by the general public. And those are people who want to know more about conservation issues, but they also want to know how to engage and how is conservation rele relevant and meaningful to them. Now, the conservation of great apes is occurring in Africa and Southeast Asia, and it's very far away, and it's sometimes hard to understand how our behavior here affects them or how they are meaningful to us. We're talking about gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans and also gibbons in, um, in parts of Southeast Asia, as we do want to make sure the gibbons are included in this conversation. Um, we do know that they're threatened by some very critical threats and they are endangered throughout their range. Habitat loss is probably one of the biggest ones. Hunting for meat, for food, and for parts. Disease is another very big threat. And then the life capture of apes um, for entertainment, for pets, and for other purposes. And so people in the West and in rich countries, developed countries, often support conservationists and scientists who are working in Africa and Southeast Asia and help set up projects to protect them in the hope that this is going to conserve the habitats, conserve the populations. And so there's support to protect research, uh, to, sorry, to support research activities, create national parks as we were hearing earlier. There's work with local communities to try and ensure that they benefit from conservation activities and therefore see the value of it. There's work to strengthen law enforcement and to establish wildlife laws that can protect the apes throughout their range. But what people in the West, in Europe, in North America, but in other rich countries often ignore is how much we actually affect the survival of apes and how much we actually directly impact their chances of survival and how much we drive the threats that are affecting them and causing them to be endangered in all these countries. And it's not just in those places far away from us, it's actually coming from us and we are directly involved in it. And I wanna give just a couple of examples that I'm sure you're all very aware about. The European and North American oil companies are exploring for oil and, and extracting oil in national parks in Africa and particularly in World Heritage Sites, which have been set aside specifically to never be exploited. Some of these sites, for example, the Mountain Gorilla Range, is the only place in the world where there are mountain gorillas, and yet that's European and North American oil companies that are doing this work. In addition, we have European banks that are funding deforestation in much of East Asia for oil palm, and that's despite the fact that there's moratoria, despite the fact that there's enormous protest by local communities against that deforestation, and despite the fact that it's the only remaining habitat for orangutans in the wild. And again, that's coming from us, that's coming from European and North American banks. And then we also have sanctuaries who've been established in Africa to protect and provide um, a sanctuary for apes that are victims of the bushmeat trade or the illegal trade. And these sanctuaries are now being considered as places where people can go and export them and sell them and take advantage of them. And these are real problems that are driven by rich countries. These are not problems that are local, that are far away from us. We are buying the products of these companies. We are banking with these banks. And we, or some of us, are shareholders in these companies. We have an incredible power in North America and in Europe to influence what they're doing and to push and demand for more sustainable use of natural resources and more sustainable um, use of land and ensuring that local communities, wildlife, and nature is actually continues to exist. So the aim of this conference is not just to talk about the conservation activities, the research activities that are going on in the field. The aim of this conference was really to look at what are the costs of the consumption that we are all part of? How are these drivers of consumption affecting apes? And to use a diverse set of voices to illustrate some of the effects of that consumption, but also some of the solutions that people are trying to find to reduce the negative impacts of that consumption. We also want to look at the cost of this to apes, and the cost to apes of humans' reckless use of their 
humans' reckless behavior and use of natural resources, and the lack of respect and em empathy for these creatures who live in the world with us. And really what we wanted to do was to bring a variety of voices to the table and to illustrate through that variety of voices what a wide community of people there are engaged in conservation. It's not limited to conservationists and scientists. It actually involves people from many, many different sectors. And I think that's the integrated approach that, that John was talking about. This is about industry working together with governments, working together with local communities, and the scientists and conservationists. And the scientists and conservationists cannot work alone to try and ensure that the apes are protected. It does require that wide community. So the aim of the conference over the four days is to illustrate some of the challenges, but also the opportunities that are there. And it's a wide diversity of voices that are going to be talking about their experiences and debating these various issues and the various costs of consumptions and the costs on apes. And it will be through stories, like the story we just heard, that we want to elevate these voices and ensure that the challenges are understood and that the media and the film festival people who are here and who will be listening to many of these stories, that they understand what needs to be done and what needs to get out there and how conservation of apes can actually happen. And also, the solutions that are out there and that are possible and to try and ensure that those are elevated and understood. So that's what we tried to do with this conference and I think I'll let Doug talk a little bit about what the outcomes could possibly be. Great, thank you very much Annette and thank you everyone for coming today. It's great to see so many familiar faces but it's perhaps greater to meet some new people and that was really the, the ultimate objective I think as we began almost a year ago planning this conference was to break out of the same old, same old. I mean, this is a, a lovely set. It's, it's very comfortable up here. But we, we're trying to break out of the comfort zone that we've all slipped into in conservation. Because what we're doing isn't enough. If it, it's not working well enough. It's not different enough. And we're, we're repeating cycles and repeating projects that don't bring new results. And that definition of an insanity that if you repeat the same thing and hope for a different result, well, maybe that we've all been a little bit crazy. We were trying to find a new paradigm. And I think it's very important that we look at this as an opportunity, not just for exposing our stories and our work to a new audience, which is incredibly important, but the dis discourse up here and the discussions should make people think again or rethink what you thought you knew. And somehow in these panels, we hope to come up with some new solutions and new opportunities, new partnerships, new alliances that will take us forward. It's very important. It was kind of, as we went along, we were planning and we said, if we've seen this before, let's not do it again. Let's throw out anything we think we've seen before at a conference. So that was actually very liberating in a way as we went about planning the, uh, the different sessions and the speakers and so forth. So if this feels like your mother's usual ape conference, let us know. We'll try to change as we go along, but it shouldn't. This should feel different. Um, I also want to point out when John spoke about the um, World Summit on Sustainable Development, GRASP was actually born at that summit. It is a program that was born 10, 12 years ago in 2001 in Johannesburg and still continues today with 90 partners and we're always adding partners and growing. And I think this opportunity we have here for meeting new partners it will, will benefit GRASP, will benefit Arcus, Jackson Hole and perhaps maybe much of the work that you do. But as we go through this conference, we will, we will not make it like the usual ones, as I say. Uh, there will not be, for instance, at the end, a joint declaration that we all just sign off on, because every conference has one of those. And that is, if anybody can name one, anyone can name one that changed the world, let me know. But we've all done it, we've all put them out there, within 10 minutes they're forgotten. But we want to create a legacy out of this summit that gives us new directions and a new road map, and as again, new partnerships, new resources, new voices, new tools. And as it says up there, no boundaries. Nothing's out of bounds here. And that's important as well. It should be very liberating in that way. But we will, over the course of the four days, listen intently, take notes, and see what comes out of this and present back to you on the fourth day a sense of where this summit went and what opportunities now lay ahead. It should feel different. And I'm very excited by this opportunity, and I hope you are too. And without further ado, I think we'll turn it over now to the first session, but thank you very much, and good luck with the summit. <laughs>